The stories contained in this podcast are the recollections of the guests we've invited onto the show. We are an outlet for people to share their truths, and we accept no legal responsibilities for the stories contained herein. I'm Kendra Sheets. And I'm Rich Gill. And this is Enough, a podcast that aims to shine light into the darkened corners of the music industry while discussing the ways we can and should improve ourselves and in turn our community. Welcome back to another episode of the Enough podcast. Uh, We are here today uh, doing something a little bit different than before. We have Joe with us. Joe is not in a band. Joe is not a major music aficionado. Uh, Joe is into wrestling. And he's here to speak with us about the crossover that wrestling has with DIY music, underground culture, and how there's a lot of things being paralleled in both these industries. There's a lot of assault and allegations going on in the DIY wrestling world as well. And I'm going to learn a lot because I am completely new to all of this, whereas Rich is much more seasoned than me. (laughs) I'm not as seasoned as I'm sure Joe is, but uh, I've dipped my toes into the indie wrestling world. I was really into like the Japanese death matches and stuff in the 90s and tape trading and all that. Got out of it for a while, but then, you know. I've kind of slowly found my way back over time. So, yeah, I'll know a little bit, but uh, I'm a, I'm ready for Joe to fill us in on more. So, Joe, can you give us a little introduction about yourself and how you got interested in DIY underground wrestling? I pretty much like started watching wrestling early '90s, but ECW was always about the crossover of music and showing like music videos and wrestlers coming out to bands like Pantera and New Jack running to the ring in a, with a shopping cart full of weapons playing natural born killers in the background. Insane, insane clown posse. Yep. <laughs> Which a music crossover into like wrestling in general. And that's where my music taste kind of started. I wound up getting into like, I would say the metal side at first because of stuff like this, more of that new metal because that was the time and place. And then new metal got me into, you know, actually good music. (laughs) Uh, But I got into hardcore and punk, uh, probably like that mid 2000s boom, uh, the emo hardcore punk scene because of wrestling kind of in a strange way um, by like, I would say gateway bands, you know, I got into like a hardcore scene by Deftones because Deftones, you know, uh, the crossover with Quicksand and bands like that, then opened my ears. And now I'm like going to, I mean, I don't go to as many shows as I used to. That's okay, Joe. None of us go to as many shows as we used to. We are (laughs) all aging rapidly. (laughs) Yes. And way too rapidly over. Yes. (laughs) 30s. Boom. Skyrockets down. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) It's true. Like in the hardcore scene, you tend to see a lot of people from those shows. And I go to deathmatch shows typically. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's like light tubes flying around, you know, chairs, everything like that. Wait, wait, wait. Can you tell the noobs in the audience, me, uh, explain what a deathmatch show is for all those of us who are not so um, involved in this sect of the world? Yes. So literally they'll put the ropes on the ring. Uh, sometimes they take those down and put barbed wire ropes or instead of the ropes there, they'll put light tubes, those fluorescent light tubes, the T10s and zip tie them to the ropes and start hitting each other with them. Uh, whatever, whatever they could find, like chairs. There's a lot of blood. So dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And it's so much fun. You know, we're all used to it. Like we went to shows that dudes thrashing around. That big dude that's in the pit that you don't want to get hit by, you're protecting yourself. So same thing with these kind of shows. It's sort of like how when you drive past like a car accident, you kind of like. It's called rubbernecking, Rich. It's It's called called rubbernecking. rubbernecking. Yeah. (laughs) So true. This is a way of doing that, though, where it's like everyone is consenting to this. They are willingly beating the shit out of each other and doing it for entertainment. Yeah. I tended to be a wrestling sob, like death matches are not cool or, and then pandemic happened and I started watching them because I had kind of time on my hands and then started going to 
that's called GCW or Game Changer Wrestling. And it feels like the DIY punk shows. And a lot of these independent shows have that feeling, that same feeling, because it's a very intimate venue with between like 200 to a few thousand people at these shows. And the accessibility of the wrestlers, you're seeing them at the concessions or the merch booth. Like you're able to talk to them. You know, after the show, you'll probably see them at the local bar, at the pizza shop, like around the corner. It kind of is like that. And then once you start going to these venues, I feel like you kind of know where people hang out. Okay, so it is just like punk. Kendra, like you brought up a couple episodes ago where you were like, you know what the vegan restaurant that all the bands are going to be at afterwards or what bar they're going to go to after the show. It's the exact same thing. It's just... yeah. And then there's always like sometimes at certain shows, there's like after parties or stuff like Mm -hmm. that. So you do have some interaction and then, you know, you pay sometimes do meet and greet or get autographs or merch or whatever. But you're always able to talk to the the wrestlers quite easily. So they do kind of have a cultural pedestal because they are kind of pseudo celebrities, but they're accessible celebrities. Yeah, they're not typically going to be hiding out. I mean, some of these people I've noticed over the years, they take public transportation to the shows. DIY or die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But most of the time, a lot of them are driving. It's kind of like the same thing with that tour mentality. Yeah. It's very yeah. much like the underground punk DIY thing where you're driving four or five hours to get paid like 50, maybe 100 bucks, maybe a lot of times less. You know, a lot of times just for like gas money just to get to the next gig or the next show. One of the unfortunate similarities that they also have in common is within the last couple of years, there's been a number of people coming forward with stories of abuse and harassment and worse when it comes to not just independent wrestlers, but, you know, all the way up to WWE, AEW, the bigger organizations, all the way down to the small ones. So, um, which is kind of the crux of why you're here today to sort of talk about that. So, Do you want to kind of give us a background of at least when it comes to the last couple of years when all of these stories started coming out? So there's always been this famous one. Originally, there's something called Plane Ride from Hell. That was one of the more famous ones that came out that a whole bunch of wrestlers went on there. I would say their jock kind of mentality got drunk on a plane and started harassing a whole bunch of stewardesses and fighting on this plane this is like a big commercial jet that's private you know this isn't a public plane just real quick to point out to people there's an excellent episode of dark side of the ring that kind of covers this so if you're not very familiar with it you can definitely check that out and get more background yes and it's on vice pretty easy to get to i think on top of it it might be on youtube and some streaming services That kind of was one of the bigger moments of stuff wasn't able to be swept under the rug anymore. Wrestling typically had that mentality, oh, the boys will be boys, let's hide what happens. And so that came out pretty much around the same time that the Me Too era or the speaking out or anything of that sort happened when fans started coming out about musicians. Uh, Wrestling had that same kind of thing going on on Twitter. People that dealt with wrestlers like fans were coming out more of talent also because in the independent scene versus a WWE or an AEW, men and women typically face each other because there's not enough women or non-binary wrestlers or trans wrestlers to just face each other. So you wouldn't get a booking if you're a female unless sometimes if you're facing a male. So there's always that uncomfortable aspect of, hey, I'm working with a guy, but I mean, you kind of have to always train with them because you're outnumbered, what, probably one to 10 per male students. Um, So you're always working with a dude anyway, in some sort of way. But more my thing is like, you have to trust them. They're protecting your body and you're protecting theirs. But that being said, a whole bunch of people were bringing up like the scandals of training, either power in the sense of like my trainer is a male he's like 30 or 40 and i'm a i'm a 17 year old 
18 year old student breaking in. So stuff like that was starting to occur. And all those, those issues of abuse kicking in, uh, people admitting that was happening to them. And I'm not dealing with this firsthand, but I would could imagine that it was very empowering to be able to go as a female talent or a female fan because there's less of them versus male. We always, we kind of dominate the hardcore and punk scene and then we dominate the wrestling fandom too. But yeah, a lot of people were empowered to bring up stuff because of the Me Too movement and music, I feel. You know, when it is this sort of small, independent organization, it's very easy to get labeled as either a troublemaker or, you know, oh, you know, you're just bringing this up because of X, Y, Z. So we're not going to book you anymore. That's it. It's akin to every venue for a band being like, well, we're not going to book you at our venue. If there is a wrestling organization or a territory that is like, we're not going to book you anymore. That's like, that's your livelihood. That's how you pay your bills, how you feed yourself. So it's very scary to come out with something like that. So when you are able to and be supported, it's huge. Yeah. And like, I don't know if this is like that with the music scene as much, but with wrestling, a lot of these times they'll do shows at a wrestling school or do shows at uh, sometimes VFWs or whatever. But a lot of the time it feels like the wrestlers or someone owns a territory. So like, if you think about it, if I'm going to perform at Madison Square Garden, the bands don't control who gets booked there, right? Like while the wrestlers control who gets booked at these venues and they can kind of trickle the effects of, oh yeah, I'm not allowed to get booked here. Then I'm not allowed to get booked a whole bunch of other places. Word travels very fast and it could be like you're blackballed practically in an instant. We kind of have that in music in that it kind of goes either way. If you've been outed as an abuser or someone who has assaulted someone, there are venues that are like, okay, we're done. We're not going to work with you. And it becomes a nationally known thing that no one wants to book this person or certain venues who have standards or promoters. and morals or promoters. Right. And then also on the other side, if you are a band that has spoken out, that has like, as we're kind of talking about here, someone who has come forward and said, this has happened to me. Again, there's going to be a situation where a lot of these venues and pro- and a lot of promoters, it's all male. So if you're a female or a trans or a non-binary, if you're in some sort of minority within the music industry, specifically the punk rock and hardcore sect, and you said, hey, you know, this band did this to me or this person did this to me, then you're almost blackballed like we were talking about here, where certain people won't want to work with you, but because they think that you're a bad actor or you're problematic or anything like that. So then it does kind of have a national domino effect that way as well. Yeah, because I was thinking it was the same, but the parallel is that the promoter isn't the wrestlers. Right. That's Mm -hmm. the difference, I think. Yeah. And that's a major problem because the guys hold the power in many ways, and then they hold the biggest power of choosing who gets booked. So it seems like with wrestling, it's the one person, in theory, one person, is the promoter who's able to make these moves. In the music industry, it's the boys club as a collective monolith that makes the choices to do, to allow and not allow certain things. So it's kind of a group working together for music where you're having very specific people in charge uh, for the wrestling side. Is that correct? Yeah, it's like, you know, there's something called the booker and that that is the guy that, you know, crew or, or person It creates the matches, like sets up, oh yeah, you face this guy tonight, you face this woman tonight. But it's also like, sometimes it's a wrestler, sometimes it's a dude like me that's running it. But you also have a whole bunch of people in your ear, like suggesting stuff. It's kind of like still that band mentality, but the lead singer runs everything. And that's (laughs) kind of the booker. One thing that I think is interesting that we talk about on here a lot is you know, music or punk rock specifically, music in general, 
really hasn't had its big day of reckoning. Uh, when it comes to people being outed for abuse or harassment or rape or anything of that nature, wrestling kind of had that a couple summers ago where over the course of, I don't remember exactly how long it was, but a pretty short period of time, it was just like story after story after story after story. And so many people got outed as abusers. Can you sort of speak to the kind of ripple effect that that had on the industry as a whole? And so I remember it, it definitely was like a weird day in like June on Twitter that I, I think All Elite Wrestling got the first major one. There was a couple people talking about their abuser basically kind of coming out with the same stories that he he beat them or had some sort of like uh, manipulation on them. There was a lot of brutal stories like, you know, one person shared, then it trickled down because like at that time I thought, oh yeah, because the perk lower on the card, he was released pretty easily. Like if this was a main eventer, a lot of the times wrestling was would be like, Oh, let's cover this up. And that started happening. And it like when that, that first one happened, then another one happened. And this person was actually one of the bookers for a major promotion called Ring of Honor. And he was he was hired a few months before to start running the shows. His was more of a position of power, like when he ran a wrestling school or something of that sort that he was actually accused of uh, taking advantage of a, a girl who was like drunk at the time. And there was a couple people that said the, con- you know, it was consensual kind of stuff like that. And the company kind of quietly like released him of all his duties. And that trickled to being like the mainstream started bringing that in around there. That there was a couple popular wrestlers like this one, one dude was like this scumbag like magnum pi kind of looking dude (laughs) that was like a mixture of magnum pi and this like 80s porn star (laughs) and his thing was always to kind of be very gross kind of like (laughs) uh skeevy that you know he takes a lollipop out of his trunks and puts it in like your mouth and you're just like oh like this guy is really doing well with this gimmick, right? Yeah. And then it turns out to be, he's actually not a gimmick. This person was starting to kind of break out into the mainstream. Uh, he, I think he might have been at the point he was at Impact, which or TNA Wrestling, which is kind of like a little bit under the two AEW and WWE. That's the Billy Corgan one, right? That Billy Corgan owns? Uh, he, he had a part of it. He went on to owning NWA or purchasing NWA. Yep. Uh, he was going to own TNA, but some stuff fell through. So that happened, and everyone felt comfortable with sharing because of those two instances. And those were like the top three to me that were like really started opening eyes of, hey, this scene is also like very close to the music scene as men are protecting each other with that kind of mentality. I'm still not over that weird lollipop thing. I'm still like thinking about that. (laughs) You're like, oh, that was a whole shtick. No, wait, no, it wasn't. You know who that sounds like? Crystalia. Yeah, comedian Crystalia, where everyone's like, oh, he's like kind of gross and weird and like, I don't know. And then it turns out like he's running this like underage cult of girls in LA and like he's just a creepy weirdo. Yeah, that tends to happen a lot with like even like acting or when you play it so well, there's some sort of like flags there. <laughs> I was just gonna say, like, wow, you really nailed that like creepy culty like underage groomer <laughs> role that you had. Uh yeah, uh, yeah, I nailed it. Uh <laughs> and the dude's like gimmick was too like he worked with women a lot. It was intergender m- matches, which men versus women, or he would tag with women. And some of his moves were like a boob flex, 
and he literally like a German suplex. You you go backwards and you take someone down, and they land on their shoulders. But he'd grab you by the boobs, and you know at first like people were like, "Oh, he's fine," and you know this person's fine, and then not so fine. Yeah, you know back in the eighties and early nineties where everything was very like over the top and cartoony. Yeah. You know, there were characters like uh, like the big boss man who was like a cop or a, like worked at a jail and like his gimmick was that's what he was. Or, you know, Doink the Clown who was a literal clown. But then as you got into like the 90s and early 2000s, everything became more reality based and there were still characters, but you kind of had the freedom to make the character more like yourself. And so, you know, that's how you end up with people like Kevin Nash and Scott Hall or Stone Cold Steve Austin. But, you know, the flip side of that is when someone's playing this sort of like gross, skeevy character. Is it like, oh, but are you really playing that character? Is that just a way? And I'm just speculating here. Like, or is that just a way for you to like act out what you want to do, but you can't get away with it in quote unquote real life? Right. With this person, too, they tended to, like, of course, always lawyer up. And unfortunately, some of these victims were kind of gag ordered or cease and desist, you know, uh, while this other person, he he tended to still get his issues swept under. I mean, his career's over in wrestling, and that's good. But still, did they really get justice? In a way, right. you're able to, in a way, control the narrative when you can throw out things like potential defamation suits or a cease and desist. And you just, you know, as someone who's receiving that, you look at it, it's like, oh, my gosh, like one hundred thousand dollars unless I stop talking. Well, I better stop talking because I can't afford that. I can't afford this. Yeah. A lot of times that's just a number that they put on there to scare you, which is exactly what it does. It's terrifying to see that so that gets people to shut up yeah and and quickly like we were talking about before it's 150 a night maybe 500 like if you're pretty high on the totem pole how can they afford a hundred thousand dollar gag order if they talk or how can they afford to lawyer up fans i want you to listen to this you can make 150 to 500 dollars a night if you pivot completely and destroy your body in a different way than normal and you become a wrestler. Or if you're Dillinger escape plan, I guess. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, it didn't. Sorry, this is going off on a tangent for a second. But uh, didn't the guitarist from Every Time I Die become a professional wrestler? Yeah, uh, Andy yeah. Williams became the butcher. You know, he, he developed it to not being able to, like, wind up touring anymore. Like... I think he left Eated a little bit before they started having their breakups. There's quite a few musicians in wrestling right now. I mean, Jericho, Chris Jericho is one of the ones that's kind of known for wrestling more than music, but he's in a band, Fozzy. Like, yep. Um, and Brody King most is another one most recently. Uh, he's in God's Hate. Uh, Misfits were wrestlers for a minute. Insane Clown Posse have their own wrestling promotion it's all over the place and as long as we're shouting it out i just got back from fest in florida and they have a three segmented wrestling day long event and there was a line around the uh, the entry around the side of the building going down the street for people to get into that venue it is a very big deal and the crossover is real so there was this whole sort of reckoning a bunch of people got fired let go some people nothing happened to them uh some of the stories kind of came out and then went away because of like you said either legal reasons or you know we've we talk about this all the time there's any number of reasons for victim survivors to decide not to pursue any sort of reparations once they tell their story sometimes they decide to just delete what they wrote and like I, this is too much for me to deal with is there still sort of the ripples from that day of reckoning happening? Has the independent wrestling scene kind of 
cleaned itself up a little bit, or are there still things like that going on? If it's going on, it's some people not admitting it or feeling that they're not protected, in my opinion. I've noticed a few like deathmatch wrestlers. They're not getting booked in certain promotions. Ones that have no standards are booking them. So there was like two. We have that in music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly it. Like, yeah. you know, there's those. <laughs> because it's like venues for uh, for music. And then it's promotions for wrestling or feds. Do those specific wrestlers have other questionable wrestlers that they go out and like perform with? Yeah, that's like one of the companies I feel like a lot of people know they don't have standards. It's called XPW. There is a Vice episode on them too, so you can yep. watch it and know that there's no standards there at a, as to begin with. It's a lot of the, oh yeah, we don't want to touch these people mm -hmm. uh, and we're just going to have them at our company. Now, they're one of the higher paying ones. So say if I want to go like wrestle there too and get paid pretty decently, I still have to work for so, you know, there's a couple like a really solid people that I met over the years in wrestling that work there and they kind of are just like, but, you know, it's it's my living like and it's one of the better spots. So I have to work there, too. And they probably like will never interact. I mean, the locker room is very small, but they might never talk. They're never going to share the same bus with the ones that they feel don't have the right morals, but they might play the same, you know, festival or same. same yeah. Show. So we, what I've noticed is that since things have started reopening, there are a lot more bands that are like packing two or three bands into a van and a car and going on like a group tour where instead you used to have someone coming for, yeah, like a package tour. We used to have like, you know, someone coming in from California. It was one band and then you'd have like three local openers and that was your lineup. Instead, here you have three bands from the West Coast plus one local, and they're all traveling together. But what it used to be for sure is exactly what she would said before, where these bands would say, I would never play a show with these people, but we have played a festival together. And we were on different stages, and it was on a different day. And what am I supposed to do if I'm on their label? I mean, we share a label. It doesn't mean that like I share their values. So it's kind of this weird muddied situation where it's like we stand for this they share a lot of ties with us through things that are completely out of our control quote unquote except they're not really out of your control while i understand the plight of some of that especially if you're in a minority group or you're up and coming or you're younger and you're trying to like work through the ranks you don't want to bite the hand that feeds you because you're getting your opportunity you're working you know your way up the ladder then you don't want to say like Yo, fuck this guy. I don't want to work with him. He's abusive. Here's the reasons why. You kind of just want to grin and bear it so you can make your mark and then hopefully at some point move somewhere else. And that's what it seems like a lot of the bands are doing. It seems like maybe that's what's happening with a lot of the wrestlers too. But then you also have to deal with, hey, I'm going to get booked against you. Yep. And bands like don't have to deal with that kind of stuff while yeah. wrestling, you kind of you kind of have to unfortunately deal with that. So I can't imagine how it is in that kind of sense. Like, oh, I can't stand this person for their ideals and what they've done. But if I do something in that ring or get a little bit too snug with them, also, that might hurt me in some sort of way. Yeah, it's a completely different layer. And it's not, like, again, it's not working with in the same way a band would be, where you have to play a festival or a show or share a stage, you are physically coming into contact with the majority parts of their body. Mm -hmm. And also having to protect them from not getting injured. Right. Right. Yeah. And hope that they do the same to you. Exactly. And then, say, with this deathmatch promotion I was bringing, XPW, I mean, you're using, like, light tubes on you and... What happens if this guy is a little bit too snug with a light tube? Uh, he follows through with the shot. You get sliced up. You get hurt. Yeah, it, it's so it's so fucked up when you think about some of these situations. Like there has to be such a level of trust there in the ring, and like you said, it could be with someone who you're like, I know this person's a fucking piece of shit, 
And I hope he does his job properly. Yeah. And I have to do my job properly. Otherwise, we could both get really hurt. And that look is so called unprofessional. Right. Too. Yep. Because, like, you know, WWE might be looking at this and hear, oh, I'm unprofessional, but it's, oh, no, I just don't like this person. And that's where it's like really complicated, right? Like, in the music industry, you don't work directly always. And then, yeah, like we were saying with the physicality of this too, I can't imagine like having to hold back. Yeah, because, you know, in a lot of instances, it could be you know the person that the person you're wrestling assaulted or victimized. And it's like, oh, I I 100% believe your story, but I have to wrestle this person and I have to, you know, quote unquote, be professional. And right not go overboard and then there's also these monologues or promos that people are supposed to cut right yeah so i'm supposed to talk about said performer and he's supposed to talk about me and then sometimes things like oh i'm supposed to push your buttons to get you right. a little bit rowdy to get you a little bit excited to go but there's like a whole bunch of topics i can't bring up when something is going down I can't shoot on this because that would be going over the line. And a shoot is like when we go off the script. Sometimes it's looked at like uh, good TV, of course, but mm-hmm. you, you do look unprofessional uh, when this kind of stuff happens uh, as well. So wrestling's had kind of a reckoning. It's still going on. They're still having to deal with things. And there's this whole additional layer that music doesn't have to confront with the closeness and physicality of all of the matches. So we consistently try to kind of workshop answers on what we think the music industry needs to do to kind of correct itself, to move forward, to keep everyone safe so we can all enjoy this form of entertainment. Because that's what it is, right? It's entertainment. And we're all kind of involved in this entertainment aspect in some way. What do you think wrestling would have to do to kind of steer the ship back onto course to get everyone aligned again um one thing is like if there's a all women's promotion trying to support that supporting promotions that don't hire these offenders if i support my favorite women's wrestlers maybe there's going to be more opportunities for them to work and not be in an awkward situation of having to only work against men maybe we could have a bigger boom of women uh working together or non-binary uh or any any segment of the lgbtq community there's a lot of positive people on this scene like ali catch like effie that are very uh that we have to support and that's kind of the differences of with even the punk scene you kind of have to support those those people that are coming out or those bands that are doing something different so we're seeing that a lot more where I got tired of listening to like four straight white men whine about women a while ago, band wise. And I feel like a lot of people now are like kind of following suit where like, especially like just with, with punk specifically, not so much in hardcore because I can't speak to that as diversely or in depth. But like there's a lot more diversity. There's a lot more female, trans, non binary people that are getting involved with punk music because they're the ones who I think should really be involved with punk music and doing things that are a lot more outside of the box. And and we're at that point now where I think like the shift is happening and you're not going to stop it. And we're about to hit a tidal wave of a lot of these like young 20 somethings that are now getting involved in music where they're not singing about the same shit. They don't sound the same anymore. They don't look the same anymore. And there's no stopping it. And it's very welcome for a lot of people, except the straight white males. Um, do, do you see something like that for ha- with wrestling happening now? Or do you see it kind of on the horizon? It's shifting. Like A lot of people are not afraid in that sense of doing something different. There is a kind of a thing called wrestling is gay. And Effie like has like a little big gay brunch. It's like wrestling, but it's all LGBTQ performers. We we need more of that though. But it, it's also like the fandom, you know, because it's a sport. I guess it kind of attracts a specific 
straight white male. In a couple of years, like, because, you know, I was saying, like, in the early 2000s, it was so masculine, party mentality. Now, slowly throughout the years, it's become like nerds start going and playing video games before shows. And now it's probably going to shift into like everyone being different, everyone coming from different backgrounds, different religions, different whatever. So I do see the shift happening, but I still feel it's very slow compared to music or the punk hardcore community. The deathmatch scene is probably, they're the most like, I guess, giving and accepting fans. So they also seem like the most raw. Yeah, it's that different kind of fan base that is accepting of it. And we're the ones that might change the game as well. So us supporting like promotions that do this kind of stuff is ridiculously important as well, right? Like wrestling's progressive, but it's not as progressive as it should be. Like I I 100% agree. And I think a perfect example of that is this is now like a few months ago because he's since been uh, let go from the company. But um, when CM Punk was in AEW and held up a sign in the ring that said protect trans kids and got eviscerated online yeah. by people who were like, how dare he do that? How dare he politicize wrestling and blah, 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 like fuck him. Yeah, protect trans kids. Isn't that something we should all agree is... I don't find that to be a political statement. <laughs> right. It's that whole thing with the punk rock scene that we've talked about on the show before. You know, the rallying cry of the aging punk rocker of when did punk rock get so safe? And it's like, well, we want it to be all inclusive, which is the whole point of it. So why do you want to make it not safe for people in the transgender community or or wi- just women like the thing that i'm hearing here is like these death matches these diy smaller group more communal spaces are where the change has to happen it's the same with shows like we need the changes to be happening in basements and garages and tiny diy venues because when those bands start playing bigger venues in the city of chicago and then they end up playing an opening for a large nationally touring band they're bringing those behaviors with them and they're able to not only impart those on stage to their fans and be like, this is the person or people that we are, but they also set examples for people that are older than them who may not have come in contact with the fact that this is now how the world is shifting and acting the way you're acting is problematic because of certain reasons. Yeah. And like on top of it, we as the consumer has probably more power than we really think we do. And like we have to speak up. Even like WWE, like right now, this might like seem a little bit off topic, but Vince McMahon, he's known for pretty much being the godfather of wrestling. He's like, the one person's name that I know that you guys said besides CM Punk. So like, that's how big he is. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, people are coming out from the late 80s. Yeah. To now. 30, 40 years ago. Yep. It's coming out that he's spending millions of dollars. I mean, it's still like he's being indicted that probably anytime soon for his crimes. Many people probably thought Vince would never go down for go what down. he did. Yeah. And I mean, the dude like in the 90s didn't go down for steroids. And now he can go down. And if that happens, that's going to show no one safe. It's a... Harvey Weinstein, it's a Bill Cosby situation. Well, we don't want to use Cosby because somebody's back out in the public oh, yeah, sphere that's these days. So that's, that's a good point. Let's go with Weinstein. <laughs> but it's a Weinstein situation where there's these like seemingly untouchable moguls who can get away with whatever and buy people's silence. Well, they, they also are like the face of the brand. They have They're, built exactly. this- Yes, legendary exactly. empire that is supposedly made of, you know, steel that'll never crumble. Like, you can't get to them because they are at the top of this giant, like, you know, untouchable pyramid of what they've built over the last so many decades. Another similar similarity between Weinstein and Vince McMahon is uh, screwed over how, how many people in the 
rise to the top. Right. Vince single-handedly crippled the territory way of wrestling when his father said he would never do that. I'm getting off on a tangent now about how he... Rich was very passionate about wrestling. I had no idea. (laughs) But yeah, he kind of, you know, he either bought up all the talent from all these other territories or just bought or just like trampled the other territories and made WWE this monolith. Also on top of it, like he was known for the guy that swept stuff under the rug. Exactly. His talent. 100%. And now this guy isn't safe. That means a lot of these behaviors need to be corrected. And that is going to, if this guy gets like some sort of sentence or some sort of proven aspect to it, then everyone else might feel safer telling their story. Right. Um, if he falls, then some of his secrets will will tumble out. And I don't think there's like a really like big comparison to kind of like with music. It's, it's interesting because it's structured differently, I feel like. Yeah, because l- like you mentioned earlier, you know, in some of these cases, and for a while in the case of Vince McMahon, even, the owner of the company is also the booker, who is also the on-screen talent. It would be like if Live Nation was a person, and then Live Nation <laughs> got was outed for being a dick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's literally like Ticketmaster and Live yeah, Nation right? going under. <laughs> And that, yeah. that's that's Vince McMahon. Vince McMahon is right. the live nation, the ticket master. Enough is a podcast centering on surviving abuse, harassment, and assault in the music scene. To help get the word out, please like and subscribe and share with your friends. If you have been on the receiving end of harm from someone, be it artist, venue owner, booking agent, audience member, or someone else, and would like to share your story on a future episode, please reach out to us at thisisenoughpodcast at gmail.com. All correspondences are kept confidential. 